Hallelujah. Come on, lift up holy hands wherever you are. Our God is good. Our God is faithful. The psalmist says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I sure hope there's a praise in your mouth this morning. Hallelujah. Our God is good. Our God is faithful. Yes, he is. Oh, he is never ending. There is no change to our God. We thank you. You are reliable. You are consistent. You are faithful, oh God. And we celebrate our God this morning. Hallelujah. Glory. Whoa. Come on, lift up your voice. Come on, lift up holy hands. Come on, worship him. Come on, adore him. He is good. He is faithful. He is awesome. He's always there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, whenever you're watching with us. Good evening to you here. Hallelujah. Good morning. Our God is good. And it's through him that we're free. Yes. Free to dance. Free to run. Free to leap. How about just free to be who we call to be? Hallelujah. Yeah. Free to be my authentic me. How about you? Glory to God. Oh, we bless you. Come on, put those hands together right where you are. Hallelujah. Oh, through you the blind will see. Through you the blind will see. Through you the mute will see. Through you the dead will rise. Through you the dead will rise. Through you our hearts will praise. Through you the darkness will Through you the darkness flees. Because of you. Because of you. My heart screams. I am free. Anybody free? Come on, say. I am free. Hey! 
indeed. Oh, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Help me say, whom the sun sets free, whom the sun sets free is free. Is free indeed. Come on, lift up holy hands. Say, whom the sun sets free is free. Whom the sun sets free is free. Whom the sun sets free is free. It's free indeed. Whom the sun sets free is free. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I am free to run. I am free to run. I am free to dance. I am free to dance. upon you yes. wherever you may it's be hallelujah. this morning this afternoon this evening our God is good we welcome you to impact church ministry where the Spirit of the Lord is alive and well hallelujah oh there's a praise in this place there's an anointing that's available for you this morning hallelujah the hand of the Almighty, I've been set free, healed, delivered, made complete, now I'm walking in victory, by the hand of the Almighty, I've been set free, healed, delivered, made complete, now I'm walking in victory, oh, said I'm walking in victory. Walking in victory. Walking in victory. I'm walking in victory. 
victory. Walking in I got victory. my joy back. Got my joy back. Said I'm walking in victory. Walking in victory. I'm walking in victory. Walking in victory. I'm walking in victory. Walking in victory. I'm walking in victory. I got my peace back. Got my peace back. Said I'm walking in victory. Walking in victory. You're walking in victory. Walking in victory. Walking in your victory. Walking in victory. Take your joy back. Got my joy back. I'm walking in victory. Walking in victory. I'm walking in victory. Walking in victory. I'm walking in victory. Walking in victory. Walking in victory. Got my peace back. Got my peace back. Said I'm walking in victory. Walking in victory. Walking in victory, I'm walking in victory. Walking in victory, got my joy back. Got my joy back. I got my peace back. Got my peace back. I got my hope back. Got my hope back. Got my strength back. Got my strength back. Yeah, 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 yeah. By the hand of the Almighty. Walking in victory. Walking in victory. Walking in victory. Walking in victory. Got my joy. Got my joy back. Said I'm walking in victory. 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 Got my peace back. Got my peace back. I got my joy back. Got my joy back. I got my peace back. Got my peace back. I got my hope back. Got my Strength back, got my strength back, got my joy back, got my joy back, got my peace back, got my peace back, got my hope back, got my hope back, got my strength back, got my strength back, got my joy back, got my joy back, got my peace back, got my peace back, got my hope back, got my hope back, got my strength back, got my strength back. Put your hands together. By the hand of the Almighty, I've been set free. Healed, Healed and never Deliver. made complete. Now, now I'm walking in victory.
I do know that he will meet you right here in worship. Come on, the song we've been singing for a couple of weeks now. And it says we're casting our crowns. We lay it down. We are nothing. We have nothing. We can do nothing apart from you, Jesus. And so today in this moment, we choose to worship you. We choose to honor you. Hallelujah. We choose to set our affections on you.
Oh, he inhabits the praises of his people. You be exalted. Oh, be enthroned upon our praise. Can we sing in unison? Lord, be. Where you are, lift up holy hands, Lord be. Lord be exalted, be enthroned upon our praise. Can we say one more time? Come on, very sweet to the Lord. Lord be, Lord be exalted. Welcome your presence, Holy Spirit. Have your way today. Speak to our hearts, Lord God. Change us, transform us, rearrange us. Draw us closer to you. We ask that you give us also the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. Open up the eyes of our heart that we may behold things in your word that we have never seen before. Your word has healing properties in it. And so we stand in agreement with you, Father, for those that need healing in their bodies. We thank you that eyes and backs and bones and livers and hearts, pancreases, skin issues are healed by the power of the Holy Spirit right now, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts of the Spirit and the word of wisdom and word of knowledge that have come forth by the unction of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for speaking specifically and tailor-making the message today to all of our hearts. Only, <laughs> only an omnipotent God could do that. And Father, as we have been praying for souls to be saved and drawn to the cross of Jesus Christ, Father, we thank you, Lord. People will hear and respond today, give their hearts to you. Others will be filled in the Holy Spirit right wherever they're standing or walking or sitting right now. For all of these things and more, Lord, we just want to thank you in advance. We want to give you praise in advance because we know they are done. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody that's glad, wherever you are, shout amen. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. Thank God for our worship team, our media team, and praise God, audio and visual team. It's such a wonderful job every time in helping us to be able to share the message of God with you. Certainly, uh, we want to welcome all of our Impact Church family. Here, if you're in Tampa, wherever you may be in the world right now, we are so glad that you're here. And if you're visiting with us now for the very first time uh, over the internet, and I just want you to know how glad we are that you're with us today. My name's Tom Garrett. On behalf of my wife, Steph, all of our Impact Church uh, pastoral team and our church family, welcome to Impact Church today. Thank you for being with us and uh, sharing this moment with us today. Of course, here in the state of Florida, as many states around the country, we're in various phases of 
reopening back to, quote, business as usual. And so for the next uh, few weeks, we'll continue uh, to have our services broadcast by Internet, Facebook, or online platform. And uh, over the next several weeks, our team, of course, will be uh, taking measures to make sure that our projected date as of now is July 5th when we will resume public gathering, even if it's still in some limited way. Again, it remains a fluid situation, so we'll keep an eye on it. And certainly for our members, we will keep you updated. But in the meantime, we're so glad that you are here today. Praise God. Well, I want to just share this morning something that really the Lord put on my heart really uh, almost, almost immediately after last week's service and sharing that message. The Lord just dropped this in my heart uh, concerning just what we need right now as a congregation. And I believe, I would dare say, all of us need, particularly as followers of Jesus Christ. You know, when we look at everything that is going on, threats of deadly pandemic and uh, potential resurgences of, of the COVID virus and social wounds from unresolved, unreconciled injustices and potential racial tensions and civil unrest and peaceful protest in the midst of unpeaceful protest and all of these things that are happening. If you don't watch it, it is real easy to lose your peace. And so the Lord dealt with me uh, very, uh, again, early after sharing the message on last week to deal with the topic of peace because we need to get our peace back. <laughs> and I, I believe that a lot of us have, in the midst of everything that's been going on, have lost our peace. And praise God, my message is very simple today. Get your peace back. Get your peace back. And so that's what we're talking about today. Get your peace back. And, and so really, I want to define peace as a way of introducing this topic today. Bible peace is what I'm talking about. We would define it this way. It, from a relational standpoint, there it is on your screen, from a relational standpoint, Bible peace means harmony, being in harmony and accord with one or more people. That is a relational standpoint of peace. And then there's personal peace. It deals with the idea of security and safety and prosperity. Here's a $100 word this morning, <laughs> felicity, which simply means intense happiness. This is what we mean by the idea of peace from a personal standpoint. But not only is there the relational aspect of peace and the personal aspect of peace, there's the transcendent aspect of peace. And transcendent meaning going beyond natural or temporal or circumstantial peace. What do we mean by transcendent peace? Bible transcendent peace is living with an undisturbed state of mind. Living with an undisturbed state of mind, will and emotions. Of course, that's your soul. The soul is the mind, will, emotions, intellect, and imagination. But when it comes to the peace of God, primarily in the soul, it means living, imagine this, with an undisturbed state of mind, will, and emotions. Being in harmony with God and fearing nothing from man, present circumstances, or outward conditions. That is the peace of God. That is Bible peace. And I'm telling you today, you need to get your peace back. And if you got it, praise God. Let this message encourage you today how to hold your peace. That's a second title if you're already keeping it, praise God. It's hold your peace. But if you lost your peace, I'm telling you today, get your peace back. Now we want to look at four principles of peace before we deal with how to get our peace back. Four principles of peace. Principle number one, joy and peace run together. Joy and peace run together. That is a person, that is a principle of peace. And we're going to see that. I mean like thunder and come on, lightning like wet with water. Come on, like fire and smoke. I think I heard somebody say like peanut butter and jelly. I didn't say that one, but you said it. But, but my point is, is that there's some things that go together. And you cannot have one, you can't have thunder without lightning. Where there's smoke, come on, there is fire. You cannot get water without the property of wetness. And so what we need to understand is that joy and peace run together. And if you're missing one, you're missing the other. Now, this is critical for us to understand because, well, I want to show you scripturally. I mean, it's not about maybe little cool little phrases, thunder and lightning. But scripturally, we need to see that they do run together. Romans 14 and, and seven, or Galatians, rather, 5, 22a. 
on your screen there. Galatians 5, 22a says, but the fruit of the Spirit is, watch them run together, joy, love, come on, joy, and watch this, peace. Love, joy, and peace, they run together, Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, watch this, but righteousness, peace, and yeah, there's the partner, joy in the Holy Spirit. And then Romans 15, 13, right next door, it says, now may the God of hope fill you with all, watch them run together, joy and what? Peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Wow. So in order to have hope, in order to have an expectation of good, we must operate in joy and peace. And if I'm missing my peace, then I'm missing my joy because joy and peace run together. And the reason that is so critical is because the Bible tells us, not in our notes, but it's Nehemiah 8.10, it says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. So if I lose my peace, I lose my joy. And if I lose my joy, I lose my strength. So I have to have joy and peace operating in my life. Those two run together. That is a principle of the peace of God. Second principle of peace is this, that peace is a heavenly substance. This peace that we're talking about, this is not a natural substance. This is a heavenly substance, and it is a part of your inheritance as a follower of Jesus Christ and as a child of God. Peace is actually a heavenly substance. It's actually a divine quality and substance, and it is a part of our inheritance. Watch this. This is why Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 27, the New Living Translation, he says this, I am leaving you with a gift peace of mind and heart. And the peace that I give, watch this, I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Notice what Jesus says. I'm leaving you. This Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross. He was finishing his earthly ministry and his physical body. He was going to the cross would get a resurrected body three days later and ascend back to the right hand of God. But he says, disciples, I'm leaving you something. He says, I'm leaving you my peace, not the kind the world gives, because the world gives a temporary peace. The world gives a circumstantial peace. The world gives a peace that is highly dependent upon circumstances and situations and everything being just a certain way. And any peace that's not rooted in Jesus Christ is a temporary peace. Any peace that is not rooted in the God of all peace, in the source of peace, is a temporary thing. But what you need, friend, is to have your peace anchored in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why he said, before I go, I'm giving you my peace. The world doesn't have what I'm giving you. Praise God. So if you are a believer, you have something in you, a substance that the world didn't give, and it's called divine peace. And so don't let your heart be troubled. It's not, I'm not reading this, not on your screen there, but I love how to amplify it. Says, he says, stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. And do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated, cowardly and unsettled. There it is on the screen. Told you they bad. They got it on the screen right there. Don't allow yourself to be fearful, intimidated, cowardly, and unsettled. It's a heavenly substance. Number three, peace is the spiritual software necessary to live a life to please God and to live a life of fulfilling our purpose. Spiritual software. Come on, everybody listening to me right now. You got a phone in your hand or in your pocket or on the table. Or you got a phone somewhere. I mean, 80, 90 plus percent of Americans have a cell phone. Now, most of us have a cell phone that's called a smartphone, which means that it has, it's intelligent. It's, it's got built-in intelligence on the inside of it. And uh, those smartphones operate by a lot of technology called apps. Apps are simply software that allow you to interface and function and, and do different things, productivity, entertainment, what have you, communication, all of them are forms of apps. Apps is nothing more than a software that allows your phone to operate and do amazing things. Well, when we got born again, heaven, let me tell you something, man has no technology on the technology of heaven. The technology of man can't touch the technology of heaven. Now, I was amazed a couple of Saturdays ago, I believe, 
uh, as I watched them uh, take men into space on a rocket for the first time, I guess, in 11 years to go into orbit and so forth. And it was an amazing thing to see as they went to the space station. The technology is astounding. But if you can be astounded by that technology, I just want you to know it doesn't scratch the surface to the technology of heaven. So what they did is when you and I got born again and stepped into Jesus Christ, they put software in us, divine software called the peace of God. And it was so, it's so critical to you and I fulfilling our mission in the earth. It is so important to you and I living a life that pleases God that they installed us with software called divine peace. And we see it again. We touched it a moment ago, but it's Galatians 5.22. The New Living Translation says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. In Bible language, Bible talk, Christian talk, we call it the fruit of the Spirit. And one of the fruit of the Spirit is this thing called joy. So it says, Galatians 5.22, New Living Translation, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. What's Holy Spirit produce in us? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, okay? And of course, meekness and temperance of the other two, but it gives us seven. But the one I want to point out here is, is this thing called peace. It is divine software. They put it on the inside of us. They want to make sure that it was in us. Peace is a part of your new nature because you are one with God. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says it, not in our notes today, but I'm remembering as I'm sharing with you today that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord, one spirit. So whatever he is in quality and nature, guess what? You are with him. Praise God. Now, you're not eternally God from eternity of eternity, but you're a child of God and a son of God, and you got his DNA, therefore you share his likeness. Praise God. So you and him are one. So his peace is your peace, and that's the software on the inside. That means you are designed by God to operate and live in peace. It's part of who you are. You don't have to try to go out and get it. In fact, you can't buy it. You can't get it. You can't purchase it. Things and all those things can add to happiness. They can add to comfort. They can add to quality of life and experience. Praise God. But the only thing that can really produce peace is divine peace. And it's on the inside of us at the new birth. Here's the fourth principle of peace. I'm just sharing principles of peace because these are the foundations that we'll, we'll rest upon as we look at how to engage peace or hold our peace or get our peace back. Fourth principle of peace. God is the author of peace, not disorder and confusion. God is the author of peace, not disorder and confusion. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 the New Living Translation says, For God is not a God of disorder or confusion, but of peace, as in all the meetings of God's holy people. God is not the God or author of confusion or disorder. So I, I say that because with all of the things, not just this, not only that are going on in our world right now and in our nation, but even what may be going on in your personal life, what may be going on in your family life, any form of disorder and unrest and confusion, let me tell you something, God is not the author of it. God is the author of peace, praise God. And so that is so important to know because whenever you have unrest, whenever you have, let me say this, strife, whenever you have division, listen, you know, one of the things that's, that so, uh, we're so, uh, we, we are hopeful about now with, of course, the death of George Floyd. And there's some conversations. Many of them are being very constructive. Uh, there are peaceful protests that are going on around the world. And, of course, we're very prayerful that there will be positive changes and positive reform and changes that come out of that. We know, of course, as the body of Christ and as the church, who's the pillar and ground of truth, we know that all change must be heart change, first and foremost, for the change to be lasting. But we're thankful for any positive things that are going forth. But one of the things that we and I need to be sharp and have good discernment about is when we see the uh, unrest and when we see uh, stuff that is just downright demonic and destructive, 
you and I need to know that God is not the author of that. That there is an author behind that, and it's not God. At the end of the day, that is Satan who is behind anything that will bring about death and destruction and, uh, and uh, 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 strife. And so we need to be aware of that because the Word tells us, even in Revelation 6, watch this, verses 3 and 4, it says, this is talking about uh, the tribulation period, okay? The, the tribulation period, two halves to that, and I don't, I'm not getting into that teaching in this moment. There's the tribulation, and then there's the great tribulation. It is a period of the outpouring of God's wrath. But one of the things that we see here in Revelation 6, 3, it says, When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, a fiery red one, went out. And it was granted the one who sat on it to watch this take peace from the earth. And that the people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So at the end of the day, when you see the kind of activity that is gendering the uh, destruction where people are motivated to hurt and wound and kill one another, you need to know that that is satanic in nature. Uh, 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 there, there are even groups, as you and I have been watching all of these things over the weeks, there are even groups that, that appear and reports that we see that are actually uh, uh, charged with, designed with instigating more foolishness. Uh, uh, in the interest, so for, uh, uh, for example, of Black Lives Matters, there's reports and, and even empirical evidence of groups that are not even black ethnically, and yet they are going around doing activities and providing uh, things and tools and bricks set on different corners of cities and so forth, and other instruments of destruction all in the name of so-called justice. That's when you know this is not just a natural thing, this is spiritual. And so you and I need to be intelligent, and when we look at all of these things, we need to see them through the lens of Scripture and not get caught up and lose our peace because we need to be a leading voice in all of this. That's a good place to say amen. amen. Now, I want to share with you, though, and here's the point of this message today, is how to get your peace back or how to hold your peace. And the seven keys that we will walk through here in the next few moments on how to get our peace back or hold our peace. Number one, this is indispensable, move closer to God. Move closer to God. In order for us to get our peace back, we're going to have to draw closer to God. We're going to have to move closer to him or to hold our peace. We must move closer to God because here's the point. The closer you move to the Lord, the greater peace you'll operate in. The closer you and I are to the Lord, the greater peace we will operate in. Second Peter chapter 1 says, may God give you more and more peace, verse 2, and grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. I'll read that again. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. So the more I grow in my knowledge of him, the closer I am to him, the more peace I walk in. Because he is our peace. He is the very embodiment of peace. You cannot get that close to peace and not become more peaceful. You cannot know peace closer and then it not affect our lives. So the first thing, we have to draw closer to the Lord. That means in times like this, we have to learn how to pull away from everything. Because if you don't watch it, you can get 24 hours a day, seven days a week streaming of negativity on the inside of you to the place where you have lost your peace. And you can walk around, you can mess around and be a tongue-talking, born-again Christian, backslidden away from your relationship with God. Or you may not be in what we might recognize as just nasty, negative, outward sin, but you can lose your relationship with the Lord just from being caught up with all the stuff that is going on around our world and lose your peace. But in times like this, we need to draw closer to the Lord. Number two. In order for us to get our peace back or to hold your peace, you must see the invisible. You must see the invisible. What do you mean, Pastor Tom? Well, in order for me to walk in peace, I'm going to have to see what the natural eye can't see. Because what the natural eyes and what the natural ears may see, what is going on in your personal life, 
what a doctor's report says, what a family member says, what a coworker says, the information that's coming across to you on the job, what your uh, uh, what a door that might seem closed to your business or some opportunity that you thought was yours, whatever it is, I'm telling you, what you see will make you lose your peace in the natural. So therefore, you and I are going to have to see the invisible. Because in all of existence, there are two categories of things. There are seen things and there are unseen things. But the Bible tells us if we're going to live in victory, we're going to have to pay attention to the unseen things. That's why we're told to walk by, come on, faith and not by sight. That's why we're told things like this. Why we look at the things, not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen. Classic verse of scripture. I love it. Forgive me if you've heard it a hundred times. If you're a member here, you have. But come on, the Holy Spirit can teach us new things every time we see it. 2 Kings chapter 6. And the context is a Syrian army attacking the children of Israel. But every time the king comes to attack and shows up to ambush the children of Israel, it gets turned on him. It gets flipped on him. He always gets ambushed by the children of Israel, by the armies of Israel. And this happens again and again and again, so much so that the king, who is not a stupid guy, he's not a dumb man, he says, wait a minute. He gathers all of his lieutenants around, and he says, I'll tell you what, guys, you got about 30 seconds to reveal to me the one who's selling us out, because I'm getting ready to kill all of you unless you tell me who is the sellout, who is the spy. Fess up right now, 29, 28, 20. And somebody says, whoa, wait a minute. Hold on, king. It's not any of us. I swear to you. It's not. Explain yourself. He says, listen, listen, we're all loyal to you, to a man we are. But the issue is, is there's a prophet in Israel. His name is Elisha. They say he knows everything the Lord tells him. They say, as a matter of fact, every time you show up, he tells the king where to tell the armies to go. And that's why we keep getting defeated every time, king. That's what's happening. A prophet of God is telling the secrets. As a matter of fact, they say he even knows what's going on in the thoughts and conversations you have in your bedroom. He said, is that right? He said, yeah, that's right. He said, well, where is it? They say he's in down there in Dothan. Fine, let's crew up, get a regiment together. We're going to have more than enough, an overwhelming force, and we're going to take him out. We're going to kill him, and that's going to be the end of that. And that's why I pick up in chapter 2, 6, rather, verse 16. So they come down and surround them at night while they're asleep. They wake up the next morning. Elisha has a servant named Gehazi. He's with him. He wakes up and he looks outside and he sees all of these Syrian armies and soldiers around them. And he panics and he thinks, this is it, man. We're going out like this. I can't believe it. He wakes up. He says, he tells the master, his, his, servant, his, his uh, Lord, Elisha, he says, listen, the armies of Syria, they're going to kill us. And he says, do not be afraid for those who are with us are more than those who be with them. And then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please, here's the prayer, open his eyes that he may, what, see. So the Lord opened his eyes. Now we're not talking about the physical eyes. You and I know that. You've got another set of eyes. Every sense you have in the natural, you have a sense in the spirit. Just like you can see in the natural, you can see in the spirit. Well, what happened? He opened his eyes, and the young man saw, behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And, of course, the end result was they got the victory. The reason they got the victory is because they could see the unseen. And the way you and I will hold our peace or get our peace back is being able to see the unseen. You got to know what's on your side. You've got to see God on your side. You, in other words, we've got to see this word, not just intellectually, but really see it where the eyes of our heart have been opened. And let me tell you how you know you're seeing. And by seeing, I don't mean you have to have a vision into the spirit realm, literally. God can and does do that. Nothing wrong with that. Praise God. We ought to believe for it, to have it every time we need it. But what I mean by seeing first and foremost is understanding. How, what do I mean by understanding? understanding that produces your heart being undisturbed. When your heart is completely undisturbed, 
with 200 million people pointing 18,000 machine guns at you with their finger on the trigger and you are absolutely at rest, you know you are seeing the scriptures clearly. That's how you know you're seeing it. So you don't have to have a sensational experience. It means your heart has been flooded with understanding that it produces peace. Because watch this. If you go back and read the story, because I've read it hundreds of times. I meditated this so often. And one of the things that amazes me about this story is when Elisha said, fear not, those that are with us are more than those that are with them. It never said that Elisha prayed. It never said that Elisha's eyes were open. It never said any of that. It just says he knew it, which means he had understanding. His eyes had already been opened, so he already knew, and that's why he was at peace. Praise God. You can be at peace through any storm, through any situation, through any turbulent trying time when you know the end result. When you know, you cannot die. When you know, it cannot take me out. When you know it, then you are at peace, regardless of what you see. And that is the peace that God wants us to walk in. Praise God. Now, the second, the third thing that we need to, let me, before I leave on from there, that's why the Bible tells us in Colossians 3, 1, and this is on your screen too, this is why they tell us things like this. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, since this is the case, and how many of you listening to me, watching me, have been raised to new life with Christ? If you have, raise your hand wherever you are. Say, that's me. I've been raised to new life in Christ. Well, if, now, if, if you haven't, this is not for you. What I'm getting ready to read, you don't apply this. Don't apply this if you are not raised to new life in Christ. But if you are raised to new life in Christ, they are commanding you to apply this. What are they commanding me to apply? Set your sights on the realities of heaven. Set your sights. When he said, Lord, open his eyes, and he saw the cherries, what was that? A reality of heaven. It was a reality that he didn't see, and because he couldn't see it, he was scared. You are scared when you don't know the realities of heaven about you. When you do know the realities of heaven about you, you stop being scared. You have peace. You stop being concerned about things and people and whatever is going on because you know the realities of heaven. But you got to have your eyes open to see that. And then they tell us this, since this is the case about you, seek those things. Which means if I don't seek them, I won't know them even though they're real. Which means I will live without it. In areas of my life, I will live without peace. I will live without prosperity, materially or otherwise, if I don't see these realities. So they tell us. He says, I'm begging you, seek these realities where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Watch this, verse 2. And just in case you're not sure what he means by that, what does he say? Think about these things. Think about them. Think about them. Don't think for hours about the quote you saw on Facebook. Don't think about your favorite episode of whatever TV or program for hours. Think on these things. Because you only got one mind, friend. You only got one mind. You don't have seven of them. And so if it's occupied by one thing, it's not occupied by something else. So a lot of things that we're thinking about, I mean, if you're born again, got a love walk with God and trying to go after God and walk with him the best you can. Uh, uh, we're doing a lot of regulating of our thoughts to block out things that wouldn't be pleasing to God, positively unpleasing to him. But I can still be occupied by a whole lot of stuff that are not the realities of heaven and still lose, still be defeated, still have a busted marriage, still be relationally broken up. Still be sick, still be wounded, still be hurt in every area of my life because I don't see the realities of heaven. And I'll be a born-again, tongue-talking Christian. But what this tells us is how important it is to see the invisible. Because he says, you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ. Hold on, man. Man, if we had two hours, boy, we'd jump into this. My real life, what do you mean? Then what am I looking at now? 
the fake one. Or I won't say fake. Uh, you're not looking at the whole truth. Because what you see ain't the whole truth. Last point. I got to go. I got to get to number three. Guys, we're only number three, y'all. We're number three. Watch this. Watch this. Why would they tell me to seek these things if they weren't wanting to show them to me? That means if we'll seek them, they'll show us. Number three. Third thing I need to do to get my peace back or to hold my peace, we must command peace. We must command peace. In other words, you must say it out of your mouth. Because in Mark 4.35, when the evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out leaving the crowds behind, although the other boats followed. But as soon as they left, a fierce storm. Now, fierce means violent, aggressive, and angry. A violent, aggressive, angry storm came out of nowhere. High waves were breaking into the boat and began to fill with water. Jesus was doing what? Sleep at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. Now, I don't know this, but sometimes I wonder. I don't know if he's answered me directly, but I've been asking him for years, were you doing that on purpose? Were you sleeping on purpose just to see how they were going to respond? Or were you just really that dog tired? that you can sleep with water coming up on your pillow, waves rocking. I mean, some of us, if a door opened, they, we so light a sleeper. I mean, we just wake up if the light get turned on. I'm not looking at my wife at all right now. I'm not looking at her at all right now. But I'm just saying that some of us sleep very light. Some of us sleep very heavy. It wouldn't matter if a tank came into the room and, and blasted off a 120 millimeter round. Uh, some, some people still wouldn't wake up. I'm not talking about myself at all. I'm not talking about my son at all. But I'm just telling you that I think that if water was creeping in around my socks and feet and all that, I think I would wake up. But Jesus was asleep. Can I submit to you, you can sleep through any storm you know you're going to pass? Amen. Amen. Well, well, they shouted, Jesus, don't you care that we're getting ready to drown? Jesus woke up. What did he do? The, sec the third thing that we have to do, he did what? He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, peace, be still. There's authority in your mouth. <laughs> what you don't speak about, you can't bring about. So you and I must be willing to speak two things that are challenging our peace to say, no, peace, be still. You must command peace. You got to speak to those things. Sometimes you have to speak to your mind and say, mind, be at peace. Your body's aching and sweating and all of that kind of stuff. Speak to your body. Body, be at peace in Jesus' name. Head, be at peace. And then temperature, I command you to go down. Or pressure in my head, I command you to go. Whatever the situation you may be dealing with. Bones, be at peace in Jesus' name. This is the fourth thing that we have to do. Take every care to the Lord. Take every care to the Lord. Philippians 4, 6 tells us about it. New Living Translation says, don't worry about anything. But instead, pray about everything. So the alternative to worry, one of the alternatives is to command, yeah. Here's another alternative. Pray. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need, and then thank him for what he has done. <laughs> Even before you see it, Pastor Tom? Yeah, especially before you see it. Thank him for what he has done. Then, then, once you've done that, then, 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 but not until then, 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 after you decided not to worry but to pray. And tell God what you need and then thank him. Those three. Then, then you will experience God's peace. Which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and will guard your mind as you live in Christ Jesus. Oh, I think about that great old hymn. Huh? What a friend we have in Jesus. Can I read a few stanzas, share a few with you? You already know it, many of you. What a friend we have in Jesus. huh? All of our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry. How much? Everything to God in prayer. Watch the B part of the first stanza. Oh, what peace. Watch this. We often forfeit. Give it up. Surrender our peace. Let the devil have it. And oh, what needless, needless pain. We bear. Hmm? All because, all because, what? 
we do not carry everything to God. All because we don't do Philippians 4, 6, and 7. That's the only reason we're bearing it. That's it. All because we didn't do it. He's ready to handle it, but you got to carry it to him. Carry every need to the Lord. Can I share the second verse with you? It says, have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Fourth thing, take every care to the Lord. Number five, control your thoughts or your thought life. Control your thoughts. The control, I want you to see a definition. It's a good working definition of control there on your screen. To control means to regulate, to supervise, to take authority over, to limit or to manage. Control, supervise, take authority over, limit, and manage. Regulate your thoughts. <laughs> supervise your thoughts. If you're going to take your peace back, you're going to have to control your thoughts. You have to regulate, supervise, manage. Because let me tell you something. Your thoughts need management. Your thoughts need management like a garden needs management. I don't know about you, but in our lifetime, we have never planted a weed. Never have. I never planted a weed in my life. I promise to you before God, I've never planted a weed. But do you know we keep having weeds show up in our flower bed? Do you know that weeds and grass and, and weeds come up in places that it's not supposed to be around our property, that I don't want to see it, and I've never planted, I've never sold one seed for a weed, and yet it keeps coming up. You see, weed represents negativity, weeds, when it comes to thoughts. And so you don't have to sow negative thoughts. They'll just come because you live in a world that is predominated by negativity. It is under the control, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, of the God of this world system. It is under the sway, 1 John 5.19, just referencing other scriptures, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, 1 John 5.19. So that is why there's negativity in our world, because it's, not, it's under the control of the wicked one. And so negative thoughts will come to you, and you have to weed them out just like you weed out your garden. God told Adam in his garden of Eve, even in the garden of Eden, he told him, I want you to guard and keep it. Why? Because he knew there was an enemy there who would usurp his authority if he didn't guard it. Okay? So guess what? The enemy comes to try to plant negativity in our thoughts to usurp our peace. Because if he's got my peace, come on, what does he have? Early in the session, we talked about he's got my joy. And if he's got my joy, he's got my strength. I've got no strength. I've got no faith. I'm a sitting duck. Oh, but people today, we're getting our peace back. Come on. We're holding on to our peace. Come on. Why? Because we're going to control our thoughts. So Philippians 4 says this. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing here. Fix your thoughts on what is true. Fix your thoughts on what is honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Watch this. Keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me. Everything you heard me uh, from me and saw me doing. Then, if you keep practicing these things, then the God of peace will be with you. See, if, 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 I don't, if I'm not intentional about, uh, intentional about keeping these things, then what happens, he says, I'll miss the God of peace being with me. Now listen, this is, this is important. First, the first half of this is in verse 8. He says, fix your thoughts on these things. Can I tell you, especially talking now to the body of Christ, obviously first to our congregation, but any of us as followers of Jesus that are listening, guys, we got to be careful here in this hour. Be careful what you're consuming and what you're engaging and how you're engaging in social media today. Be careful, guys. Be careful you don't get caught up with your mouth and your mind and all of the negativity. And be careful how you use those spaces. I believe they can be used in a good way. I believe they can even be used in ways that can provoke us to think about things we need to think about. I believe it has some ways that we can be used in a constructive way or even in a good challenging way. But we in particular in the body of Christ has to be careful 
that we don't get caught up in a place where we're just full of all kind of negativity and strife and trying to get folk together and this, that, and the other. Because what happens is when we do that, our minds are not fixed on what is good and true. Our minds are fixed on trying to war and battle with folk whose minds you are not going to change anyway. Now, once again, I didn't say there isn't a place to use it. I believe in using it. I believe there's a place to use it. I believe there's a place to, 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 to challenge us in our thinking or to, or to challenge us even, praise God, in, 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 uh, even in areas of complacency or compromise. I believe that's important. But in my personal observation, an overwhelming majority of what I have observed, which hasn't been everything, is the kind of negativity that isn't moving anybody forward. Because a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. <laughs> you often are not going to change anybody by the strongest argument that you can marshal. And at the same time, hear me very carefully, I believe there's a place to use it, praise God, and a place to be in that space. Amen. I'm not against it. But watch how it affects you on the inside. That's the point. So we must be intentional about setting our minds on those things. Romans 8, 6 says this. For to be carnally minded is what? Death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Wow. Carnally minded versus spiritually minded. What does carnally minded mean? Carnally minded just means my thinking is not being shaped by God's word. Spiritually minded means I'm allowing God's word, God's opinion, God's thought, God's counsel, the word of God to be my perspective on everything. That's what it simply means to be spiritually minded. And when I am spiritually minded, when I'm spiritually minded, watch this, about myself. When I'm spiritually minded about my relationship with other people, when I'm spiritually minded about where I am in life, when I'm spiritually minded about my relationship with my wife or wife with her husband, when I'm spiritually minded, it will produce peace. When I'm carnally minded, it will produce death. So spiritually minded simply means I am thinking in line with what God's word says about that subject. And when I do that in that area, any area, finances, personal, relationship, the physical temple, society, what is going on in our world, I must see it through the lens of Scripture, then I'm spiritually minded. If I'm not seeing it through those lenses, watch this, I'm going to end up with wisdom that is either earthly or sensual or demonic because there's only four sources of wisdom. And every stream of thought and opinion that you and I have about any subject and about any area, every stream of thinking you have is coming from one of four sources. It's either earthly, natural things that you can measure and weigh and so forth, natural scientists, information, so forth, or it's sensual based on our feelings and opinions apart from God, or it may be straight up demonic. And I don't even know it. The fourth way is wisdom from above, right? So I want to operate in wisdom from above if, praise God, I am going to have and maintain my peace. So the point that we need to understand about that is that we can move in and out of that at any time and not even know it. But I want to be spiritual minded because that will produce peace. Let me give you this example. And and it's found in Numbers 13, and there's reference there that they'll put on the screen. It was the children of Israel. Remember, they were going into the promised land that God told them to take. Uh, the 10 spies, 12 spies were going in. 10 of them were afraid. Two of them believed, Joshua and Caleb. Well, when you get to the end of chapter 13, notice what it says in verse 30. Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. They said, let us go up at once and take the land. We're certainly able to conquer it. But the other men, they said, no, we can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread a bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled and explored will devour everyone who goes to live there. And all the people uh, we saw are huge. Watch this. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's the way they thought about us too. What happened? They were carnally minded. Because they did not think in line with what God said. 
So carnally minded is thinking about yourself less than what God thinks about you. Carnally minded is thinking about yourself based on what other people think about you and not what God thinks about you. Notice they said we were grasshoppers in their thoughts or in their sights, and so were we in ours. When you and I see ourselves less than the way God sees us, we are carnally minded, and it will not produce peace. It produces anxiety. And as a result, they didn't go in. Joshua and Caleb, they were spiritually minded. Why? Because they simply agreed with God. They said, yeah, I know they're bigger than us, and they, they, they just might eat their inhabitants. But you know what? If God said it belongs to us, it belongs to us, and we're going to get it because God said it. They were spiritually minded, and it produced peace. Notice this. Watch this, folks. Two groups of people looking at the same thing. How can you see it differently? One has a carnal mind. The other has a spiritual mind. The spiritual mind produced peace. The carnal mind produced anxiety. The carnal mind, watch this, they never entered into what God had for them. The spiritual mind walked in peace, guess what? They entered into everything God had for them. This is so powerful because that means sitting right next to you in church or in the office or wherever you are. There can be two people, one who has a spiritual mind, they'll walk in what God has for them. The other who has a carnal mind or not thinking in line with what God says, they won't experience God's best because they're not walking in peace. Peace makes you be able to rest. Peace makes you be able to say, you know what? Everything's going to be okay. God's got me. He's on my side. Amen? Praise God. Well, that's so important that we, we uh, manage and control our thoughts. You know, in a car, you can have a... Uh, meters and indicators on your car to tell you what's going on, if your gas is low, if you're, you know, if the oil is acting up or something, some other thing and system on the car is faulty now. I mean, they even got things that'll tell you how much air literally is in every tire. Oh, we got a low left front tire, you know, we need to fill it up. Why? Because an indicator is there. What if we had indicators that could tell us whether our minds were on the things of the spirit or the things of the natural? You can. You have an indicator. You know what? It's the peace of God. If your thoughts are not producing peace, you know they are carnal. <laughs> or they may be even demonic. Or they may be sensual. When my thoughts are not producing peace, encouraging me, strengthening my faith, helping me to see that I overcome, making me feel like more than a conqueror, then I know my thoughts are not wisdom. They're not coming from above. So that's how we can know at any given point where our predominant thoughts are. What are you feeling on the inside? See, I know we're taught not to walk by feelings. That's right. We ought not walk by feelings. But if we're rooted in the word of God, we can see, wait a minute, I can judge my feelings and to help me see as an indicator where my thoughts are. And if my feelings are full of anxiety, I know, uh-oh, my thinking is not in the right place because I'm not experiencing peace right now. But praise God, we're getting our peace back. And so wherever you're at, say, I'm getting my peace back. And here's the sixth thing we need to see to get our peace back or to hold our peace. Live to please the Lord. Proverbs 16, 7, the Living Bible. The Living Bible says, when a man is trying to please God, God even makes his worst enemies to be at peace with him. Proverbs 16, 7, the message says that when God approves of your life, even your enemies will end up shaking your hand. Praise God. When we are seeking to please God, living to please him, living for an audience of one. Man, I'm telling you, church, Christian church, disciples of Jesus Christ, followers of Jesus, we need to be in this hour about pleasing God. Don't get so caught up. Don't get yourself caught up in all the strife and warfare that's going on and verbal jabs and verbal conflict that's going on that you end up losing your peace, that you end up not having a life that's pleasing to God. Your job, I, listen, it, different people have different assignments, different platforms, different places we're supposed to be and way we're supposed to impact people, but don't get yourself caught up there. Be careful on how you, how you manage your time, manage your energy, manage those social media spaces. Praise God. I'm not telling you to get off and not do anything, man. I'm in it, and praise God, you may see me express more in different ways over the coming months and years, what have you. But what I'm saying is you got to manage your mind in that thing the right way. 
Praise God. So live a life to please God, and then all the other stuff will take care of itself. And here's the seventh thing that we have to do. Uh, the, the seventh thing that we have to do. The seventh thing, you must have, praise God, you must have a word life. What I mean by a word life? You have to have a constant diet of the word of God. You have to keep yourself fed on the Word of God. Watch this, Psalm 119. This should be 119, 165. Psalm 119, verse 165 is what should be there. You may have 116. But 165 says this, Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Great peace have those who what? Love your Word, and nothing causes them to stumble. When I'm loving His Word, feeding on His Word, it keeps me from stumbling. John 16, says this. Jesus says this. I have told you all these things so that in me you may have peace. Here on earth, you'll have many trials and sorrows, temptations and so forth. But take heart because I've overcome the world. All right. Watch this, verse 1. Same chapter, watch it. Watch what it says here in verse 1. It says, these things I have spoken to you so that you would not get offended. What's that mean? If you go back and read chapters 14, 15, 16, 17, that was all one discourse where Jesus was talking to his disciples. And he says to them a few places, I'm telling you these things so that you don't get offended. Translation. I'm telling you the scoop in advance. I'm telling you it's going to be some foolishness. I'm telling you it's going to be some mess. I'm telling you, Matthew 24, that in the time toward the end, near the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the upheaval that will come in society and culture. I'm telling you this stuff in advance so as my followers, you don't get tripped up and get caught up in all of that and forget the perspective that you're supposed to have. And your heart gets all drunken and intoxicated with the strife and foolishness that's going on in the world. And you lose the leadership and influence you're supposed to have. So don't get caught up in that. So he says, I'm telling you these things so that you don't get offended and tripped up. Don't get offended when something jumps up. Don't lose your peace. When you get offended, you lose your peace. Somebody haul off, say something you don't like. Say something, you know, you know look at you the wrong way. Do something, offend, try to offend you. Don't get offended. You're going to lose your peace. You lose your peace, you lose your joy, you lose your joy, you lose your strength, you can't walk by faith. Okay? So, it's so important. All right? You must have a word life. Now, last thing, the Lord gave me actually a word. It's a prophetic word for us, particularly as a church. But if you're a follower of Jesus, man, this belongs to you, brother, sister, whoever you are. But this is specifically for Impact Church of Tampa. And it is right out of the word of God. It's a prophetic word for the peace of God. And as I was studying within the last several days, uh, this just came to me. And I, I believe it's to, to be shared as a prophetic word, a word that we're to lay hold of and apply and see this working in our lives because of the times that we're living in. Job chapter 5, it's verses 19 through 27. And I'll leave you with this prophetic word. Grab a hold of this. Job 9, 5, 19 through 27, the New Living Translation. From six disasters, he will rescue you. Even in the seventh, he will keep you from evil. I'm talking about getting your peace back. Verse 20, he will save you from death in the time of famine. You will not lose your home. You will not go broke. Your kids' needs are met. Whatever your physical needs, they are met. He will save you from death in the time of famine and from the power of the sword in the time of war. Don't fear evil happening to you. Don't fear violence taking you or your children. You will be safe from slander and have no fear when destruction comes. Because stuff happening around you, you don't need to be afraid. You can have peace. Stop fearing slander. Stop fearing what people are going to say about you. Have peace in that. He says, you will laugh at destruction and famine. What is that? That's a place of security and confidence to the place where you can laugh at destruction and famine. 
In other words, you're saying to the devil, you can't touch me. That's a posture in the spirit. That's a posture of dominion. Wild animals will not terrify you. You walk in and a, and a raccoon comes, stop screaming like a little girl. Say in Jesus' name, I have a covenant with God. Get away from me. <laughs> you will be at peace with the stones of the field. And its wild animals will be at peace with you. You see a wild animal? You see a dog that got loose coming up to you? Pit bull? You don't have, or whatever, what else would make you uncomfortable in the natural? Remember this prophetic word. God's not playing games with you with his word. He means this. He says, you will know that your home is safe. When you survey your possessions, nothing will be missing. You won't be stolen from. I declare you will not be stolen from. I declare your home will be safe. Verse 25, you will have many children, births and pregnancies of married couples in Jesus' name. And your descendants will be as plentiful as grass. You will go to the grave at a ripe old age. And I don't have time to tell you, but when the Bible calls you ripe and old, that's, that's old. Like a sheaf of grain harvested at the proper time. Verse 27, here it is. We have studied life and found all this to be true. So listen to my counsel and apply it to yourself. That's what the Lord is saying to us. That's how you get your peace back. And that's how you hold on to your peace. I want to invite you to pray with me. Father, thank you. You have spoken to us and you are speaking to us today. I thank you that it is your will that we walk in this peace. This mental state of being undisturbed, no matter what is going on around us, personal life, family life, social life, the world and city we live in, thank you, the peace of God is in us. We have a covenant of peace with you, and we receive this Word from Job chapter 5, praise God, 19 through 27 as a prophetic declaration to us. We receive it in Jesus' name. We declare our homes are safe, our, our, our possessions are safe, our children are safe. We find ourselves in an undesired situation with an animal or a snake or a bird or a raccoon or a wild dog, we will remember what to declare out of our mouths. I have a covenant with God and that wild animals shall be at peace with me in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. We'll speak to situations and circumstances and watch them be calm in Jesus' name. Now, I want to invite you to consider these invitations as we speak about the peace of God. And I want to ask you, do you have peace with God personally? Peace in your soul with Him. Do you know that you are right with God? Do you know that you are in His family? Do you know that you're born again? Do you know that God forbid that should you breathe your last breath today, do you know where you would spend eternity? Do you know there's a real heaven to gain and a real heaven, hell to shun and to avoid? There is. And if in your heart you're not at peace, you'll know it right there. And I want to invite you to be at peace with God right now by just praying with me in just a moment. I want to invite you to pray and come, at, come to peace with God. I want to invite you to be sure of your peace with God. I want to invite you to know where you stand with Him in just a moment. That's the second invitation if you're not sure. Number three, I want to invite you, if you know that you have come to peace with the Lord, but now you're no longer walking in peace, I want to pray with you today to be restored to your peace with God. Your relationship with God is so important. It's more important than any other relationship. Any other decision you'll make is your relationship with God. It's not a game, folks. It's for real. And I want to pray with you in this moment. Let's not take this for granted. If you've never been filled with his mighty Holy Spirit, I'm telling you the Lord's will for you is to be filled with his spirit. Filled to the overflowing. And then number five, if you don't have a church, a local church that you're a part of as a follower of Jesus Christ, the Bible says God has set in the church members as it pleased him. It's the will of God that you are a member 
of a local church. If you sense this is where God has sent you, then we want to tell you what your next step is. So while you're there, focusing on the Lord, listening to his voice, and even responding and saying, yes, let me pray with you right now. I want to lead you in these invitations that I gave you. You can take my words, but if you use them and mean it, the Lord is everywhere. He'll meet you right where you are. So let's pray. Pray this way. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to save me now. I ask Jesus to come into my heart and to save me. I know that I'm not at peace with you. I know that I'm not sure of where I would spend eternity, but I want to be sure. And I sense your spirit. I don't even know how to describe it, but I sense my need for you. So I'm crying out, thank you, Lord, for hearing me. Come into my heart, save me and forgive me. I receive your forgiveness, Father. I thank you for receiving me into your family. In Jesus' name, amen. And Father, I come to to return my life to you. I come to recommit myself to you. I want to come back to the peace that I used to know. So Lord, I give you back my life and my heart. Be my Lord. Thank you for cleansing and forgiving me from all unrighteousness. You are Lord. You are in control. Be my God. Be my Father in Jesus' name. And Father, I come to be filled with your mighty Holy Spirit. Lord, you said in Luke 11 that if I ask to be filled with the Spirit, you would fill me, so fill me to the overflowing. I thank you, Lord, that as I'm filled with the Spirit, I'm gifted with a mighty, powerful prayer language. Father, I thank you right now, those that are asking to be filled with the Spirit, you're filling them right now. They'll even pray in the Holy Spirit, that mighty gift that we've given From the day of Pentecost until now, Lord, thank you for filling people with the Holy Spirit. And then lastly, if you don't have a church, say right now, Father, I thank you for leading me to this church. I thank you, Lord God, that I'll know the next step. I'll walk in it, and I can't wait to connect with my local church family. Thank you, Father, for leading me to this church in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Praise God. First, congratulations. You may have made one or multiple decisions. You may have prayed different ways. First of all, man, we're glad, we're thankful. But beyond that, heaven is rejoicing when anyone turns and takes a step closer to God. So congratulations. Now, I would love if you would allow us to help you make a next step. On the screen there, there'll be a number where you can text the word CONNECT to. If you'll text the word CONNECT there to the number on the screen, We'll be able to serve you digitally some information that will help you take the next step. So thank you for taking a moment to do that and allow us to respond to you. Praise God. Congratulations on the decision that you have made today. Now, we're just about ready to end the service. Now we're going to take the opportunity to show the value that we place on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, in our tithes and offerings. In this opportunity to give, I know that all of our Impact families familiar with all the ways to give. They're on the screen there, uh, digitally, of course, online, using the app and so forth. Or by text, you can do that as well. Also, of course, if you desire to give through the mail, you can place that envelope in the mail and go to our administrative office and we will uh, have the folks to attend to that and get that processed as well. So all of those ways, thank you for responding that way. I want to encourage you from Genesis chapter 15 today in verse number 1. This was after Abraham had come back from an amazing supernatural victory where they took his nephew Lot. He gathered an army of people that he put together, 318 people, and they defeated five armies. That was supernatural. When he got all of the spoils from the victory, he gave a tenth of that to an Old Testament type of Jesus Christ, a high priest called Melchizedek. So much to say about that. But when he offered that to him, praise God, then, of course, Melchizedek blessed Abraham with the blessing. And then chapter 15, verse 1 says this, God responding to Abraham's action of that offering to Melchizedek, who was an Old Testament type of Christ, says this, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. Fear not. Oh, watch this. Watch this. Be at peace, Abram. 
Why? Because I'm your shield. I'm your protection. I'm your comforter. And I'm your abundant compensation. And your reward for obeying and honoring me shall be great. Can I tell you, God hasn't changed. Praise God. Let's apply that to us. Thank God he sent us today. I'm your shield in this time. I'm your reward. and Your reward shall be great. Well, I, let's take this opportunity to pray now over our offerings. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to give, worship you with our giving. Thank you for watching over your word to perform it in our lives. We give you praise and thank you that uh, you are our shield and our exceeding great reward. Thank you for the favor, divine, inc uh, uh, divine connections, supernatural income, checks received in the mail, witty inventions, and understanding and favor all around. We give you thanks for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise God. One other thing we'd like to do just before we dismiss today is we certainly want to uh, say uh, to those who are visiting for the first time, and honey, come on up and I'd like you just to close out with me. If you're here for the first time, uh, again, thank you for being with us today. But we'd love for you uh, to text the number on the screen and write the word welcome there on the store. Text the word welcome to the number on the screen there. That way, we'd love to be able to get some information back to you, Pastor Steph and I, thanking you for visiting us today. And then maybe you have a prayer request. We'd love to join our faith with you. Write it down there. Tell us, and we'll do that. So thank you so much for responding that way. And of course, I know, uh, praise God, Pastor Steph, you're so grateful uh, for those who have been praying uh, with us here uh, as her, her uh, grandmother went home to be uh, with the Lord in a great, uh, in a good age, praise God, and just left such a legacy of, of just uh, blessing and faith and uh, some wonderful examples that we get to live on in. And so we're thankful for your prayers and appreciate that so much, all right? Well, listen, until we connect again, have a blessed week, and we love you, and we'll see you next time in Jesus' name. Bye for now.